So hello everyone, we're going to look at Dunn again, John Dunn, which we did look at last time, uh, but just briefly uh, looked at one poem, A Valediction Forbidding Morning, to try and talk about a, uh, a transition um, in which uh, we leave the medieval Renaissance worldview behind, even though John Donne is writing within the Renaissance period uh, after the Reformation has taken place. And uh, we see a lot of uh, the past in that uh, very modern man, John Donne. We even, we'll even see bits of the courtly love tradition in Donne. So the poem I didn't talk about in class, I assigned the reading but didn't uh, look at it in class, The Flea is playing something on the courtly love tradition there. Um, and uh, so that's always lurking the, in the uh, background. And what I like to say about Dunn, who is writing in the early 17th century, Elizabethan period late or early 17th century, is this is a period where um, there is the old certitudes are being questioned for sure, but there's a lot of, um, they've not yet moved on from the past. They um, tend to, like to hold on to everything. They cover all their bets, basically, like in uh, gambling, which I don't do, but in gambling, you can put all your uh, chips on one spot or you can spread it around. They spread it around. They cover their bets. They make sure that, uh, in, in a sense, because they're not, it's not that they're not certain what the truth is. They think that they, they can see truth in many different respects. So there's something to go to the cosmology issue. There's truth expressed in the Ptolemaic cosmology that Dunn wants to hold on to. On the other hand, he sees that Galileo with his telescope has demonstrated that the old uh, model of looking at the cosmos can't be correct, um, that there's something wrong with it. And so what he does is he says they're both correct. And there are ways in which one is correct and the other isn't and vice versa. And last time he said the way that the old one is correct is that it had a spiritual truth which was unchanging uh, as opposed to the contemporary one which seems more scientifically accurate. However, if it is true, then everything's moving and I don't see that it's moving and this is greatly distressing and problematic. And so he's just, he compares that to Again, God's love versus uh, material ways of looking at love, etc. And he likes the contrast. And metaphysical poetry, and Dunn is a metaphysical poet, delights in that tension between two equal and opposite ideas. And he will affirm both of them. So it's a very rich period in terms of um, poetic symbolism. And they, there's... Uh, they don't, they're not bothered by contradicting themselves. And they're not all bothered by being overly clever for that matter. Uh, so if you thought my reading of A Valediction Forbidding Morning was a little bit, you know, you're down to, you know, the sun being represented by a circle with a dot in the middle and like the pair of compasses. Um, I don't know if it's uh, overly clever, but I think Dunn's overly clever in the way he looks at things. So if you do see something there, he probably would not be displeased that you're seeing it there. So that's the nature of the age. Dunn himself was not only a, uh, a poet, in fact, his poetry was not really his uh, vocation at all. Uh, he was chiefly, uh, Dr. Dunn, a famous preacher at the most important Anglican church in London, St. Paul's. And, uh, his, uh, his sermons were published as well. And uh, he was very much uh, regarded as, as the fine preacher of his day, certainly in Anglican circles. And um, became a role model of sorts for, sorts for the figure we'll look at next class, George Herbert, who was very much of a different temperament, more, purit more of a Puritan than Dunn is. Dunn, Dunn is... Uh, uh, perhaps not quite as uh, allied to the Puritan cause as, as Dunn is, as Herbert is rather. But 
Dunn's holy sonnets we're going to look at today as a sequence, and they are a sequence. So as I say, um, now as you can see, there is a whole slew of them here. We're going to look at sonnet one and sonnet five and sonnet, I think I said 13. We can have a brief look at, at, at uh, 10 as well. And what these are, are reflections, and they, they almost need to be read consecutively. They deal with a person who's dealing with sickness and death and, and meditate on those topics as a consequence. And there's, as, the, as he reflects on his sickness, he ref reflects on the meaning of sickness in relation to uh, God's designs. They're called holy sonnets. And particularly, you know, the connection between sin and death and redemption and health and God and life and the fact that in Scripture, God refers to his church as his bride and he himself is the bridegroom. And this is not just uh, Ephesians 5 stuff where husbands are told to love their wives as Christ loved the church. This is a long-standing um, image that's used in Scripture going back to the Old Testament, uh, particularly prominent, prominent uh, in, uh, gosh, I've just drawn a blank, uh, the minor prophet, uh, ooh, whoa, 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 that's bad. I don't usually have that these days. Who is it? Drawing a blank. Bible books. What's the name of it? Malachi, Haggai, Zephaniah. That's not good. I'm still not thinking of it. Joel, Abadiah, no, Micah, no, no, Habakkuk. I'm not thinking of Isaiah, but it's in Isaiah as well. I'm thinking of one where he tells the prophet to take to him a prostitute. Hosea. Hosea. Thank you. <laughs> Terrible. Where is it here? I didn't see it. So where's Hosea? Oh, it's because I, <laughs> oops. So that's why I didn't see it. Go get for yourself a woman of prostitution and children of prostitution for the land prostitutes itself turning away from the Lord. And so he does this and then says, it's, here's what it's like for me. So Israel is presented as a, a harlot, a prostitute, one who sells herself f to other gods. That, that's language that's used here in in Hosea and it's it's imagery that's actually used throughout scripture but it's very strong there it's also in uh, Jeremiah uh, presented that way in which the, the the city is presented as a prostitute and so forth the allegory of unfaithful Jerusalem uh, so heady stuff and uh, and rather provocative and it it, it persists throughout scripture what is this? John Dunn's birthday? Why do I care about that? Where did that come from? Oh, it's because I kept that open. Um, it's there right at the end of Scripture in the book of Revelation, where there are two women presented uh, who are also two cities. There's Babylon the Great, the great harlot, and then there's the heavenly Jerusalem who's presented as a bride and, and arrayed so. Uh, and even if you want to see in the wisdom literature, you'll see in... Uh, the uh, again I'm drawing a blank I don't know what's happened to me today the um, what's the wisdom literature Proverbs honestly um, where Lady Wisdom is presented as calling out in the streets and she has a counterpart who's presented as, as a, an adulterous woman and they both cry out in the streets, calling for 
the young man to give his attention to her. And Solomon says, don't listen to her and do listen to her. So this idea of portraying uh, the church, the faith, the people, one's heart uh, in uh, the terms of, of a lover are very strongly presented in scripture. And uh, Don is meditating on that in relation to himself because he's going to use another, this keeps falling and it's really making me crazy. I wonder what I can do. I think I can just stick this up here. I'm just going to start with this and let it dip down. It won't matter. Uh, he's going to use uh, a, f a figure that is common in the ancient world, and we saw in Plato's Republic, the idea of a person being like a microcosm and the world or outside of him being like a macrocosm. So everything that's true of the world as a whole is also true of the individual person. So the reason that Plato is able to look at the Republic is because he sees analogies between a whole city and an individual. And within the individual, there'll be faculties that represent various features of a city. So for Plato, he wants your reason, the power of reason to be the ruler of your body. And the body is represented by the appetites and so forth. So you have to govern your body by the use of your reasons and let your, let your virtue lead you to listen to your reason and not listen to your passions, which are, which are gonna mislead you just like the poets do who inflame your passions and get you to think bad ideas and to follow bad conduct, etc. So that idea of the microcosm and the macrocosm, very strong and done. I say these because you need to understand this in order to read these poems. So I'll just write it down. Microcosm and a macrocosm. And if you think these are a little bit fancifully apply, applied to the Christian faith, Jesus calls the body a temple and says that he is the temple as well as the great high priest, as well as the altar on which the sacrifice is made. And he compares us to being living stones planted in that or set in that same temple. And he's the chief cornerstone of all that. So that idea of a microcosm, macrocosm, I think is not... Uh, exported externally and put into scripture, it's there in both places. And I think you need to see scripture that way to see what's going on. You need to understand that there's a relationship between your individual life and the life and good of the body politic. So there's the body, your own human body, and then there's what's good for everybody. And so that this is why it's important in terms of your own personal life that you have to master yourself before you're going to be a master of your own family or a master of your company or a mayor or a prime minister. You have to, self-governance is the beginning of all that. Because again, the microcosm, macrocosm analogy holds. So if you can't control your tongue, and you can't control your words, and you can't control your actions, how can you be trusted to exercise control over other people? You're led, you're led by bad impulses. This is bad conduct. This is why we prize people who are self-controlled. It's something to be sought after. Um, at any rate, I say all that because Dunn is going to use this idea of a microcosm, macrocosm in this uh, sequence of holy sonnets. But as I say, the, the um, context for these is the problem of sin, sickness, and dying. In his day, uh, more so than our day, people regularly get sick and they often die from it. More, more so than in our day. People here got terrified by COVID a few years back. People lost their minds and were willing to be locked inside for the craziest, pre, on the craziest pretexts. Um, and, and healthy people were sequestered, not sick people, healthy people. Dunn's day, there was sickness all around them. The plague would sweep through. Uh, pastors would go visit people who were dying with, with, with illnesses, and they might contract them when they go visit them. They still visited them because they saw it as a ministry of the church. This is what Christ does. He goes to the sick and the lame and the poor, and he heals them. 
He's not afraid of death because death is not the greatest threat to his life. Falsehood is, false teaching is. Departing from the path of Christ is. Anyway, that's how this begins though. And I said it's a sonnet sequence. Let me just say something about sonnets because we haven't looked at the sonnet as a form yet. And I can't recall if I mentioned this or not, but uh, yes, I did in relation to Dante. Dante wrote love sonnets, and love sonnets were invented by an Italian Renaissance poet by the name of Francesco Petrarch, and they were courtly love poems. So sonnets were originally written as courtly love poetry. It was a form invented in the Italian Renaissance, and it was written for that specific purpose. Courtly love, so it is, and what, what about those conventions? Well, it's somebody who is falling in love with a superior woman in order to uh, instigate an adulterous affair. So again, rather useful for what I've just said, setting up this sonnet sequence. Yes, comment or question. No, the Italian son sonnet or Petrarchan sonnet contains an octave and a sestet. So an octave, the first eight lines have a, a pattern within them, and then the last six do. But between the time when Petrarch inaugurated the sonnet and the time that the English are writing sonnets, the sonnet form has changed. And it's changed just because, in a sense, English is different than Italian. Uh, so that would be one reason. You want, you know, you want to use the form, but you can alter it a bit. Remember, Dante wrote in Terza Rima, and I said that you really can't do this in English very well. It's very difficult to hold that because um, in English we don't uh, vowels are often silent, and um, they don't. You know, most words don't end in an a or an e or an i or an o or a u, whereas they do in, in Italian. It's very melodic in that sense. 14 lines, and initially it's subject matter. That would make it, but it would be the, it would be the form. It's a lyric poem. It's a, a, it's, it's a short poem uh, put to music, as it were. That's what lyric poems initially would be. They would be sung. Lyric poems were often dedicated to the themes of love, just like today when we have popular music. They're short songs. That's one form of poetry, a short love song. It's the one that we most use to this day, most popular, but it's not the most important form of poetry at all. We don't use the longer forms anymore. We only use the lyric poem for the most part. Um, but between then and there, uh, English poets have used the sonnet sequence and they've changed a bit. Spencer will use it and he will do things a little differently. So will Shakespeare. Shakespeare, let me just comment since you talked about it, I'll come to you right then. Um, rather than the octave and the sestet, he will write three quatrains and then a rhyming couplet at the end. So three times four and then a, a two at the end. So it's still 14 lines. Rather than an eight and a six, it's a four, 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 and then a two. Now what the uh, Shakespearean sonnet allows you to do is introduce three movements, as it were. Rather than one and then a response to it, there are three movements and then the rhyming couplet sort of summarizes it or, or can move it in a different direction. So it's a little more flexible, it allows more uh, movement within it, different thematics, uh, uh, matters in it, and so forth. A comment or a question at the back? Because uh, um, back in the days, people were like literate, right? So I'm just curious about the like, um, oral component of the, the rhyme and the poetry. Is that why like, most poetry like, rhymes and things like that? And the like, pandemic is like, so important to it? So is it because it was oral poetry and people weren't as literate? that it had rhyme? Kind of, yeah. So the chief mark of poetry is meter and not rhyme. 
It's the, it's the main thing. It's what they, it has in common. It has a meter. And what a meter is, it's not rhyme, but it's a regularity. It's a pattern of, that you can hear. Songs have, at least songs uh, used to have in church in hymns, they have a meter to them. It's usually iambic tetrameter in songs, not pentameter, but tetrameter. The, the uh, hymns that would be sung in churches traditionally. And that regularity allows the congregation to know what to expect and to know how to pronounce the words on the page. They know how to sing it because it's regular, right? Modern songs tend to be unpredictable. They tend to be sung by one person up front and it goes up and down, it goes over here, it goes longer, shorter, it's chaotic. It's not, it's not orderly and it's not usually very poetic either, by which I mean it, it doesn't have a, a stable meter. It'll speed up, it'll slow down, if you know the song, fine, but if you've never heard it, there's no way you're going to be able to sing that song. It, it, even on the page, it doesn't have any regularity or order to it. Now, there, why would you say, what's the difference? Who cares? Well, order is one of the features of God's own work, not chaos. Chaos appeals to the emotions. The emotions are chaotic. The emotions are very expressive, for sure but they're not controlled by a pattern of order. And we see that as allowing for freedom, right? That's why we, we lean towards chaos. We think there's more freedom in chaos. Our forebears would disagree strongly with this. If you want freedom to be exercised uh, in a way which can be appreciated, there has to be order. It's, a, it's actually one of the uh, dictates of running a church service. It's gotta be orderly. What a funny thing to say, except that it's a reflection in, in the microcosm of the macrocosm, right? Go back to what I just said about that, being stones in the temple. There has to be order. Even when it, when it comes to prophecy, it has to be in a court. There's a certain rule. Oh, you're, you can have prophecy, but, but don't just shout out in the midst of, midst of a service. You can't do that. You know what? In, it used to be on the books in Canada. I think it still might be that it's actually illegal to interrupt a service of worship. For somebody to come into the church and start shouting and so forth, they can be arrested. Which normally you would say, it's a free country, free speech, what, what's going on? It's because of the understanding of the importance of the order, the order of service. Anyway, that's off topic, but the, but, the, but the question you asked about poetry in the oral tradition, um, it does have an order, but it's not always apparent to us what it is in translation. In, in Greek poetry, it's apparent there in the meter, but the meter is a different way of understanding meter than our understanding of meter. That's partly pro one of the problems. Uh, it's accentual meter rather than um, our, our sense of meter, but our sense of meter is the same as the Italians. Western European languages have the same type of meter. Um, so meter will be the chief feature, and then sound features like rhyme um, are adornments to that, but they're almost secondary. They're not as important as the meter. So rhyme is, a, is a, a, the same sound at the end of the line. You can also have it at the beginning, which we called alliteration. And we saw that in Anglo-Saxon poetry, that's beginning rhyme rather than end rhyme. You know, the puffy, proud pigs pontificated, that's p -p 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 okay. And people laugh, yes, but it has a sort of, you know, it adds a, a beat to it. And, and you, can do, you can do that in the middle of it as well. And all of those stylistic figures add adornment to it and order to it and beauty to it or humor to it, right? Because if you, again, you alliterate so strongly, everyone's laughing because it's, you have, have to come out of your way and you start saying stupid things like puffy pigs pontificating or whatever I said. You, you had a, Yes, yeah. Uh, um, a gnome, I th I'm not sure if that has to do with cutting or just measuring. It's probably measuring from gnomos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And so you can speed there. It's there. It's related to the speed, the frequency of the of the oscillations. Here it's the same speed. It's more where is the emphasis in the line. So thou hast made me, and shall my thy work decay? Repair me now, for now mine end doth haste. What you will notice here, by the way, uh, is a pause in the middle of the line. Me now death doesn't do it there, but there's often a pause in the middle of the line in done. That's closer, a uh, closer ref reflection. Remember when I put the Anglo-Saxon Beowulf on the page and he saw there was a, actually a gap right in the middle? English um, song often has a natural pause in the middle of the line. Occasionally it actually gets written that way, but often there's just a natural breath in the middle of the line. And in hymns there definitely is uh, there. Um, so it's how it's pronounced. So it, I don't think it's because it's from an oral tradition. No. Um, and um, I have a lot of thoughts on the oral tradition underlying the written tradition. That's, I dealt with in my lit theory class recently, and that is a long and perhaps tedious <laughs> excursion I'm not going to get into here. But that is, it, yeah, no, I won't say anything more. But this is a... What sort of sonnet is this? So you mentioned um, that it ends with art and heart. So what sort of sonnet is it? Well, let's look at the end of the, the scheme. So decay, haste, fast, yesterday. So if we use a letter at the end of each where it begins with something new, we'll start with an A, decay. Haste is different, so we'll call that B. Fast is the same actually even though we pronounce it differently so it's a b again and yesterday is the same as the first line so it's a b b a way cast waste way so a b b a a b b a the again me sustain c d c d e e what exactly is it here he's blending He's mixing things a bit. He's using the rhyming couplet which Shakespeare would have in his sonnets, but it seems like the first eight movements are an octave. And then in the sestet, then he breaks it up a little bit. So uh, there is a structure to a sonnet, and there are conventions and associations with the types of sonnets, because Shakespeare does something with his sonnet form. And, and Dunn is writing just after Shakespeare. I mean, just he would have read Shakespeare's sonnets and uh, would, would be just playing with the form and seeing whether it suits him in what he's trying to say. This is what we do when we write poetry as well. It's like, okay, I have a message that I want to convey. What's the best way to do that? And if I use that form, and if I use this melody, are, what are people going to associate with it? Is it in a major key or is it in a minor key? If it's a minor key, then it's a bit more somber and maybe I want to do that. Or maybe I want the irony of that and so I'll use the minor key for a happy song and it's going to sound a little odd. Everybody's going to feel the tension there. So you can use the conventions against uh, the expectations. So this is where a, a poet makes his uh, living in uh, these sorts of things. So is, can I put this all in one? Yes, I can. So let me just read the sonnet. This is sonnet one. And because this thing keeps collapsing, let's see if I can put it up. And does it even matter? I don't know if it does. But now I can see the whole screen at any rate. It immediately begins. It's called a holy sonnet. It is who's the uh, person being spoken to? God. It's, he uses thou, by the way. Thou in English is a form of intimate address. We don't use it anymore. We use you. You is the, is the polite form of address for somebody you don't know. In English, eventually, it took over and we lost the use of the word thou. Nobody refers to other people as thou anymore. They only use it in reference to God in which case they tend to associate it with distance and politeness, etc. It's the exact opposite. 
You use thou for somebody whom you are intimately acquainted with, your, your spouse, maybe your children, but you know this person extremely well. In, in other European language, they still have this. In French, it's two, and in, same in Spanish and German. They, they all retain that sense of intimacy in the second person. Same here. So when he's speaking to God here, he is close to God. That's why he uses that, and he doesn't use you. When he will use you, he's expressing distance. His audience would know, we, we, we tend to miss it because we've lost this, the importance of this. But thou hast made me to God, and shall thy work decay? Repair me now, for now mine end doth haste. I run to death, and death meets me as fast, and all my pleasures are like yesterday. I dare not move mine dim eyes any way. Despair behind, and death before doth cast such terror, and my feeble flesh doth waste by sin in it, which it towards hell doth weigh. Only thou art above, and when towards thee by thy leave I can look, I rise again. But our old subtle foe so tempteth me that not one hour myself I can sustain. Thy grace may wing me to prevent his art, and thou, like adamant, draw mine iron heart. Note the, um, the whole poem is laden with associations. There are lots of actors in this and lots of symbols. Like at the end, he talks about adamant drawing his iron heart. Think of like uh, when you did um, physics and the iron filings and the magnet and it draws his iron heart, the adamant's a heavier metal and it pulls him, it's a, an attracting force. But there are all sorts of different forces here. One of the forces is death. And he's dealing with the problem of, of death now and the problem of the fact that although he sees himself as a spiritual being, nonetheless, he's going to die. And he's aware of the fact that he's gonna die because he's sick. And he's seen what happens when people get sick. In uh, Calvin's Geneva, if you didn't call the elders within 48 hours of being sick, you were under church discipline. Because you never know. You mean, he, you mean he, this, is a spiritual, this is a spiritual test at this moment. It's not just a physical ailment. You have to call the elders to pray for you. So they're, they're, they're aware of the, the, the nature of physical health and illness and spiritual health and illness. It's strongly correlated. We know, but we talk about mental health. Oh, people in past ages weren't aware of the problems of mental health. It's nonsense. Of course they were. They just didn't think that the, uh, the emotions were the center of a, or the sum total of a person's existence. They thought order was. Um, anyway. But note, so he begins with the problem. And the problem is one which is also the solution. Thou hast made me. So if God made him, then how can it be that God's purposes would be thwarted because he knows God to be good and perfect and loving? So here's the problem then. If, that, if thou hast made me, shall thy work decay? God's perfect, I'm not. Okay, so immediate response, repair me now, for now mine end doth haste. I am close to death. I run to death, and death meets me as fast. We're coming together. It's like a lover, two lovers coming. I'm running towards death. Death's running towards me. Remember, in every man that death comes along, well, he's going towards death. His sickness is making him go that way, and all my pleasures are like yesterday. So that's the opening gambit, the first four lines. And then he builds on that in the next four. I dare not move my dim eyes anyway. Despair behind and death before doth cast such terror. Now this line that runs over from one to the next is called enjambment. The line doesn't, uh, with cast doesn't end until it stops in the next line. It pushes over. It expresses 
the disorder that's broken into Dunn's life. He's breaking, even though it, it rhymes on the end, within the line runs over. It overruns the order, just like death is overrunning the order of his life, the integrity of his life, the wholeness of his life is being breached by the line. Note how I read it. I, I didn't stop at the end of the line because there's no, there's no punctuation. You keep reading. Doth cast such terror in my feeble flesh, doth waste by sin in it. Don't stop until the next line. So it, that's how distressed he is. The order has been broken. How do you demonstrate the breach of order? You have to have order to begin with. So if you begin in chaos, there's no remedy to chaos. If chaos is your basic principle, go back to what I said about the, the creation accounts. The two, two ones, one begins in chaos. The other begins with in the beginning, right? God created the heavens and the earth, right? A question or? Enjambment. I'll spell it for you because there's a silent, at least in my pronunciation, enjambment. We could do a whole uh, course on poetics and talk about stylistic devices and met different types of meter and so forth. That would be a course in practical criticism. I've not run that here in many years, but. You, we could do that, and, and poets intentionally use certain devices to create a, an effect, and it does create the effect. It's part of the craftsmanship of writing. But note, it, it runs over, and the running over is a, is a breach in the regularity, and so we notice it, it jumps out, just like sickness jumps out. We don't notice it when we're healthy. That's the normal. We notice it when we're sick. We complain when we're sick unless you've been sick so long that sick is your normal, in which case you stop complaining about it. You just suffer it. Yes. Practical criticism. Yeah. But doth waits by sin in it. So there's the explanation. The terror is directly connected to the sin. Normally, we don't even acknowledge sin. We acknowledge sickness, we acknowledge death, but what is the cause of those things? It's the sin. Remember, it says in Scripture that, that sin gives rise to death. That's the judgment upon the original sin as well. If you eat of that tree, you'll die. Which it, twas, which it towards hell doth weigh. So now he's introduced a spiritual problem into the poem for the first time. The problem isn't sickness and death. It's a spiritual illness unto death. This is, how, this is the dark bottom of, the, of this particular poem. He's not just physically sick. It, his, he's losing faith in God. There's a despair that's creeping in from the sickness. If you're sick, if you're mentally distressed, you, it's easy to lapse into spiritual depression. In which case, at that point, you start to think what was you thought was healthy and normal was a deception, and the real normal is this. And you reassess and you don't think I'm temporarily sick, you start to think I was temporarily healthy. And the real state of my soul is this. So it's not that there are pinpricks of darkness in the midst of the light, it's that you've got a big black canvas and there's a couple diamonds in the middle of it that you can see and they're really sparkly, but guess what, most of it's black. But then with this, he then begins the counter movement. Only thou art above. So here's the consoling thought. And many of the Psalms work by this, like this, by this way as well. The counterpoint back, starts with the problem, and then he tacks back and then goes in again and so forth. He has to speak to his own soul. I have a problem. I'm sick. My enemies are after me. My friends have betrayed me. 
Right? That, that's, it begins with that. The rich are wicked and I'm poor. That's the problem that we begin with. And then so, but God is like this. So let, and so there's this inner dialogue going on. But here, only, only thou art above. And when towards thee by thy leave I can look, I rise again. Aha, so spiritual solace. God, and it says by thy leave, I rise again. So God actually pulls him up. It, it comes from God. But our old subtle foe so tempteth me that not one hour myself I can sustain. Dunn is strongly influenced by Calvinism, like all the English uh, church is in this day. All of it is influenced by this. I do nothing good of myself. Only with God's initiating grace can I do anything of good for myself. And here, it's to the point where not one hour myself I can sustain. Thy grace may wing me to prevent his art, and thou, like adamant, draw mine iron heart. So this is a, a, a note of consolation at the end of this, an encouragement. Because if it's up to God, then it's not dependent on his poor, wicked, sinful, dying self. Yes, question or comment? Yes. Well, you could. Okay, so then, so first point when you're interpreting a poem, is to notice what's there, and then the question is why. And I said that it's because of disorder that the line is broken, right? So there's an orderly line, and then he breaks the line. Okay, but then you say, and because it contradicts what I just said, rightly, good observation, but hold on, God's now doing the counter movement, and yet I see the exact same thing here, there's enjambment. But note this, what's in common with these four lines? There's a parallelism. Such terror by sin in it, only thou art above, by thy leave I can look. In other words, it enjams there and there, but in each case, these two lines are juxtaposed to these two lines. There's a parallel being drawn there. So in response to the breaking of order, God's in the disorder as well and pulling him out of the disorder. That's my clever, fancy reading. It made a perfect sense, and I have no idea if it's correct. Uh, after that, there's no more examples. Correct. It solves itself. It is extraordinarily clever. And I have no idea if it's right. But I notice that there is actually those two breaches of order, and that's followed by return to order, but there's still that feature. And then once it's fixed, then it goes back to regularity. And in the end, he's totally dependent on God, and God's pulling him. So he, it, it ends with a very happy note. Is this a house of Christ? Yes. Yes. There's a lot of flexibility within the line, but yes. Very clever, isn't it? Artful. So that's Sonnet 1. So it begins with that, and it begins with the consoling note that Grace might correct his situation. In Sonnet 2, he is back in the mud again. I'm not going to do, read Sonnet 2 or 3 or 4, although I love Sonnet 4. I'm going to do 5, where we directly have a microcosm, which he ex expressly invokes. As I say, this isn't a Christian idea alone. I think it's in Scripture. The idea of a microcosm, macrocosm, it's there in Eastern philosophy, furthermore, by the way. 
the idea that you're composed of basic elements and the world is as well. So if you want to treat somebody, bring somebody to health, they have too much of one ingredient and so you, you counterbalance it with a bit more of something else or you treat hot with cold or sweet with sour or like with unlike and so forth. So you know, you've been bitten by a, uh, a snake, well a little anti-venom is a little bit more of that or, or um, allergy shot is a little bit of the thing you're allergic to. So you can do with a, with a contrary or with a little bit of that. So that it's a way of recognizing the relation of microcosm to macrocosm. I'm going to inject a little bit of this into you and that will help you, your body and the defenses of your body, we talk about that even, your immunity fight for itself unless you have an autoimmune disorder in which your body fights against itself. But this basic idea of microcosm and macrocosm is, is deeply rooted in almost every uh, culture. But as I say, in biblical and, and in uh, ancient uh, Greek and Roman thought. But here it is. This is Sonnet 5. I am a little world made cunningly of elements and an angelic sprite, but black sin hath betrayed to endless night my world's both parts, and oh, both parts must die. You, which beyond that heaven which was most high, have found new spheres and of new lands can write, Pour new seas in mine eyes, that so I might drown my world with my weeping earnestly. Or wash it if it must be drowned no more. But oh, it must be burnt. Alas, the fire of lust and envy have burnt it heretofore and made it fouler. Let their flames retire and burn me, O Lord, with a fiery zeal of thee and thy house, which doth in eating heal. What did I just say about thou and ye? And you. Formal, polite, distant. You meet somebody for the first time. Use the polite form. You feel any distance. You don't know you're meeting somebody for the first time. He's feeling alienated from God. Do the same thing in Hebrew. Sometimes Jesus calls God Abba, Father. Sometimes he calls him Eloi on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? It's distant. The Son of God who is one with God is distant from God. He senses alienation and distance for the first time. The breach of relationship. In the cry. He's still saying God, oh, it's still God. Yeah, but it's a God who he, whose face he does not see. He's cut off by our sin. He's bearing our sin, our sins up in front of him. He sees the wrath of God on him. He's bearing the wrath of God at sin, which he has, of which he has none. He still knows it's God, but he doesn't see God's face. There's no smile looking back at him. There's menace, there's a frown, there's wrath. Right? In the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, at the very thought of it, he sweats blood. Right? He knows what's coming, does not want this, but will do it. Because it's God's will that he should do so. So if you think that the Son's working against the purposes of the Father, the language expressly tells you otherwise. He's doing it in obedience to the Father, and the Father wants him to do this. Why? Because it's for us. It's extraordinary stuff. You need small little details, but all, everything pivots on them. So when he says, uh, black sin in both parts of my, where was the you? Oh, it's line five. You. not by the end. So note, it's a very small thing, but if you overlook it, you miss the whole transformation that's taking place in the poem. 
But if you want to see the effect, he's thinking about sickness and health. What's the truth source of health? It's in a right relationship with God, who is life, who is love, who is our peace, who is our Passover, who is the Lamb, the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. He's all of those things. He's the Holy One. All of those things. But at this point, there's, he sees death, and death makes us feel that God is distant from him. He doesn't care. We suffer. Where is he? It's a problem when you're sick. In, in body or mind. So you feel alienated, you feel isolated, you feel on your own. All you sense is your pain. When people are uh, in, uh, I was a pastor, when people are, are uh, struggling in a congregation, they move to the back of the congregation. People sat in the front, they move to the back. They're still there. Why are they moving in the back? Is it, am I? <laughs> I smell. No, it's nothing to do with that. They're, but they're distancing themselves. It's, it's a physical representation of what's going on in their own heads. But how come? Did I offend them? Or is there something else there? Could be, could be that it was the person speaking, but it could be the, it's the whole community. The center's here. They used to be here. Now they're moving back. OK, you see that. What, what do they do after the service? Do they go off on their own? Do they talk to other people? Or are they? And which way are they moving? Are they moving in or are they moving out? It, that sign of somebody wandering off is the lost sheep. That's distress. They're distressed. How, how do you go? You have to go get them. You have to talk to them. You to sort of figure it out. But the cues are there. Same in a family. Faces are downcast, turned away, moving away, whatever. You don't have to tell them off. You just sort of, you know pull them back in in little ways. Maybe they don't want to be. It's a bigger problem. Who knows? But anyway, that, that is what he's portraying here in the sonnets, is that sense of distance and alienation. And it's expressed in the only way he can. It's just a poem here with a U. So it's very abstract in that sense. It's in, in his head, he knows. I'm a little world made cunningly of elements, the four elements, earth, air, fire, water and an angelic sprite, so the spirit which is in me. That he's thinking now like a Greek. But black sin hath betrayed to endless night my world's both parts. What? The body and the spirit. And oh, both parts must die. Okay. ABBA, by the way, ABBA, once again. But note at the end of the octave, he doesn't end it. It runs into the next line, into line nine, to a new rhyme scheme even. So this is, again, a little bit of breach in the order of the poem. You just notice it and try and figure out, why has he done that? Sometimes it's because the person on the internet is too stupid to follow the punctuation that was on the page. That can be the case, by the way. Don't trust the internet sources necessarily. Some people just don't care and they're sloppy in punctuation. So it just could be that somebody's, or throwing a comma in where there isn't one in the original. So don't, don't, uh, don't exclude that possibility. But I mean, you're, you, what are you going to do? You've got a printed edition. You have to go by what's there on the page. But, or wash it if it must be burned, no more. OK, so let me get through the octave first of all. Sin has betrayed both, and both parts must die. OK, so the body he knows is going to die. There's a physical death. But there's also a spiritual death that comes because of sin. And he is subject to that because he is a person. There are two determinations in a Christian's life. One is that of sin, and the other is of grace. Sin is still a part of your life if you're a Christian, for which reason you need to repent daily. People sin who are Christians all the time. But one determination is stronger than the other. If you don't repent, that may become stronger. There's a need for repentance for your good. It's an awareness. It's a recognition of the, of the reality of who you are. But the other determination is Christ's call from grace to pull you from the consequences of your sin. And that is far stronger breaks the power of sin. But the way you demonstrate it is by acknowledging that you have no, nothing within you that can save yourself, but God has 
been effective in doing so, so you live in the light of those two determinations. And occasionally, the old dead man keeps kicking. And so you have to keep on killing him, put him to death. So this is a little paradox. Like, why, do I, why did I do that? Why did I speak that way to my wife or my kids or my mother? Or my, like, why did I do that? I love my mother. I love my wife. Why did I say that? She didn't deserve it even. Sometimes she does. Maybe she deserves worse. Do I not deserve worse? Yes, I do. But why do I say I don't even know why I say that. Acknowledge it, confess it, apologize, repent of it, seek not to do it again. Don't make it a repeated pattern. Recognize that grace is there. Grace overrules that. That's what the Christian faith says. It's stronger. But he's distanced there at this point. At the beginning of five, both parts must die. And he is disconsolate at that thought. You, which beyond that heaven which was most high, like how distance? Remember I showed the Ptolemaic cosmos, the, the empire of heaven or the kingdom of heaven. It's way up there beyond our sight, further up, further in. The city is way up above us. Okay, sure. But you're just, you're so far away from me. You found new spheres. What's he talking about? He's the new, talking about the new heavens and the new earth. And of new lands can write. So that great God who can create everything new. Pour new seas in mine eyes, that so I might drown my world with my weeping earnestly. So bring me to repentance, which comes from a contrite, the tears of genuine repentance and sorrow. But that's just a physical expression, and drowning has the connotations of what God did to, in the time of Noah. And he's not going to do that again. It says in Scripture, they'll never again flood the earth. Never again. So if, if it may be drowned no more, wash it. Washing in baptism, clean it then. But at the end of scripture, it talks about a fire of judgment. Oh, but it must be burnt. Alas, now, now he's going to control, he's had two different types of waters. There's the flooding, destructive, the washing, purifying. Now he's going to talk about two fires. There's the one, the fire that takes Dido down to the underworld of her passion and her self-destructive lust for Aeneas, which knows no bounds. Alas, the fire of lust and envy have burnt it heretofore and made it fouler. So that sort of fire makes me a worse man. I don't need that fire. Giving way to your feelings is not always a healthy thing. Often, in fact, not so. Let their flames retire and burn me, O Lord, with a fiery zeal of thee and thy house. Now again, thee and thy house, which doth an eating heal. Now here he's talking about the refiner's fire that purifies the gold. It's a zeal for righteousness. That comes from God. It's a God-given sense of his goodness and his mercy and his power. That is what he calls for. But again, note how he makes these contrasts, he juxtaposes them, and it's the contrast that really brings them. Just like I said, the light, if you go over, go to a jeweler and they're, looking, they're trying to sell you a diamond, which they're always trying to do this time of year. They put it against a black matte backdrop, right? It, the black matte absorbs the light. It doesn't, it doesn't shine off it. It just, the light disappears into it. That makes the diamond sparkle that, that much more brightly. And, and sin and suffering and death are the black matte backdrop that allows the bright light of the diamonds to glisten and shine. And that's what's going on here. By the end of this, he's shining because he sees the light. He sees a different type of fire, which at first was a corrupting, destructive fire. Well, there's another type of fire hidden beneath that. Powerful poem. Yes. He's also working again with the microcosm and macrocosm when he talks about the flesh versus the backbone. Yep. Yep. 
So the whole world was once flooded. My little world's going to be flooded with my tears or with the waters of baptism, which have the same sort, they're connected. Repentance, my, my, my tears are a sign of my repentance and awareness of guilt. And I will confess my sin and be baptized because of faith in my Redeemer. Yes. So, it, yes, he, he holds on to that. So he concludes that, wow, what a great ending. This is my play's last scene. <laughs> He's immediately back down in the dumps. There. It goes like this throughout the whole sequence. I'm not going to look at the uh, sixth sonnet, but you can see this. Seven I love, again, it sees the world as having four corners where angels are blowing their trumpets. I'm going to skip over that again. And nine. To go to ten, which I love. Maybe his most fa famous of the whole sequence, which is why I'm going to deal with it. It says in 1 Corinthians 15 that the last enemy is death. Is it not 1 Corinthians 15 where it says that? And death in the end will take down everyone in this room unless the Lord comes first. There will be a time when some people will see the Lord Jesus return without having died. There are those who've been taken from life before they could die, like Elijah and Enoch. But in general, death will take each one of us. And death, in that sense, is a conquering hero. He, he's an unbeatable opponent. And everyone's terrified of death. Remember, every man. And none of his friends want to go with him. So this is the sonnet to death. Now, remember, these are Petrarchan sonnets. So the original context is it's a love sonnet towards an illegitimate object, the aristocratic woman. Read the, we'll read the poem. Death be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be, much pleasure. Then from thee much more must flow, and soonest our best men with thee do go. Rest of their bones and souls delivery. Thou art slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men, and dost with poison, war, and sickness dwell, and poppy or charms can make us sleep as well. And better than thy stroke, why swell'st thou then? One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. First of all, he speaks to the death as thee, which we've already said is a term of intimacy, and he is, we're going to be questioning it immediately. Why is he speaking of death in such terms? It's almost um, familiarity breeding contempt here. He speaks to him as a familiar, but a familiar that has no, um, has no threat to him, carries no threat. And it's a, it's a pretty much an entire sonnet, which is an um, un un uninterrupted sense of triumph over death. Like, this is the high point in the whole sonnet sequence in this sense. He's not in any doubt. He's in total conviction that death is no threat to him. Why? Because those who do die, don't die. In what sense do the people who die not die spiritually? Those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. 
How come? Because he has faith in the Lord of life who rose from the dead. Death is my enemy, but my enemy has already been defeated by the Lord in whom I trust, who has me as in his arms, and he will not let me go. So, I'm not afraid of death. Now, he elaborates on this, but this is like a taunting. He's taunting death. Remember I said in, in, uh, in uh, Beowulf, there's the flighting before the fighting, you know, the smack talk, the whatever, the trash talking, and then the punches come. Here's the trash. He's trash talking death. Why? Okay. Well, because we already have experience of something like death, which is when people rest and sleep. We feel better after those. I'm going to wake from the end, and death is compared to a sleep, sleep by the Apostle Paul. Those who have fallen asleep, they're dead. Yes, but they're going to wake up in the morning. So they are in, from the world's vantage point, those, are dead, those people have died. We're sad. They're not sad. They're going to wake up from that sleep. It's like a sleep to them. We already see people fall asleep and wake up in the morning. That's what it's going to be like. So from rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be much pleasure, then from thee, because this is just a pale shadow, the reality will be even more contradicting of the, po contradictory of the power of death. Much pleasure then from thee, much more must flow. Now this is a specious argument, but he's happy to make a specious argument. And soonest our best men with thee do go, rest of their bones and souls delivery. Who are the best men he refers to here? What's the word we use to describe those best men who go with death soonest? Martyrs. We hold them up as examples for ourselves. We think they are models to be followed. So if the best men go there, this is where we all want to go. We're not worried about this. Even more, death has bad company. He hangs out with the, the wrong crowd. You think you're mighty and dreadful. You, you're a slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men. They all bring people to die. Okay, these are the worst sort of crowd, and you hang out with those people. Mm. And you're with, you dwell with poison, war, and sickness, and poppy or charms can make us, make us sleep as well, going back to the sleep metaphor, and better than thy stroke, why swell'st thou down? One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death thou shalt die. So it's a taunting song. It's not the last in the sequence, however. So he's feeling really good about himself. He's thrilled with the... I want to do 11, but I'm going to skip over it. Yeah, because I have 10 minutes and I want to come to 14. I said at the outset I wanted to do 1, 5, 10, and 14. And this is the one. Now, I said, introducing the whole sonnet sequence, the idea of the adulterous woman being compared to unfaithful Jerusalem, being compared to the heart that goes astray from God, we're referred to as harlots. It's a metaphor. Modern feminist script, uh, criticism doesn't like the metaphor, and you know, I think, oh, I don't know what to do about that. They like it that we have lady wisdom. <laughs> so, I mean, you, we're, we're dealing with the study in contrast, so you can't have it both ways. So if you want the, you know, the, uh, the, it to be a man, then you can have the man as the figure of wisdom, and you may not like that as much. So, I mean, choose your poison. It's a study in contrast. That's, that's the point here. If God's the bridegroom, then having a woman personified as wisdom is no bad thing. Although then the personification of wisdom is a reflection on the church and the body of Christ, which is to have wisdom, and not just the individuals, male or female, in it. And you need to apply it that way. It's to be read that way. Anyway. This is, the last was triumphalistic. This is the exact opposite in some way. He is not able to escape. But now the problem is not death. It's the greater problem for the mortal, namely sin. So here it goes. Batter my heart, 
three person God for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine and seek to mend that I may rise and stand or throw me and bend your force to break, blow, burn and make me new. I, like an usurped town to another do, labor to admit you, but oh, to no end. Reason your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captive and proves weak or untrue. Yet dearly I love you and would be loved fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie or break that knot again. Take me to you, imprison me, for I except you enthrall me, never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. Dunn is not a man uh, for soft words or soft sentiments. This is a very uh, aggressive poem. But it begins again with you. And it ends with you. Which says to me throughout the whole thing that he doesn't have any sense of consolation at the end. There's no reconciliation per se. He sees the distance. But he knows in his head. But he's using extraordinarily trigger warning alert language in this poem. It's very strong. It begins with batter my heart. It's an imperative calling to God to do this. Batter it. Think of himself like a, a castle. Break in here. You're at the door and you're Come in. At the moment, you're not getting in. At the moment, you're on the door, and what are you doing? You're knocking. You're rubbing. You're breathing. You're shining. You're polishing the door. Break it down. That's what he's talking Knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend. At the moment, you're just trying to fix me. You know, the, the, the house is... It's falling over and you're, you know, you're doing a sort of a budget job and you're sticking something and it's a very, it's a, it's very poor because it's still falling down. It's not working. Compare these first four lines. The first two need to be contrasted with the second two. Knock, breathe, shine, that I may rise and stand or throw me and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. Knock, break, breathe, blow, shine, burn. Seek to men, make me new. So at the moment, you're just keeping me up on my feet. I'm limping along. I'm sort of standing. I'm limping along, and you're trying to, you give me a crutch and so forth. I need new legs. I need a whole new me. So this, you know, little help's not, it's not working. I need the whole thing. So you need to take me down. If I'm going to stand up, I have to be overthrown. Who's the me that has to be overthrown? The sinful self. The, thin, the self that's actually in, in uh, is complicit with the enemy who's working in my life. There are three threats to your soul. Your sin, the world, and the devil. Those three. My sin likes the world. It wants the world to rule in my life. And the devil does as well. Those three are all working here. And guess what? I'm part of the problem. It's not just the devil. I don't want the solution. The solution's too hard. It's a little too radical. But he's at the point now where he's calling out for this. As I say, don't seek, he's not, don't do this and seek to men. Make me new. Total rebuild. Are you going to do the, like anyone's done house renos? Are you going to do that? It costs just as much to rent. You may as well just take the whole thing down and build up a new thing, as long as the foundation works. 
So that's the opening gambit, first quatrain, you, men, ben, nu, do, and defend, untrue. Same structure, ABBA, ABBA. But here in the second quatrain, because I do think it's a, a quatrain, even though it's written as the same rhyme scheme, but it moves in a different direction. One was the door of the house. Now it's the whole town. So one was the private sphere. Now we're going to deal with the public sphere, the whole civic realm. Just like Jerusalem, right? The two cities. There's the city of God and there's the city of Babylon the Great. And that's how it, at the end of Revelation, that's how it's portrayed. There are two cities in this world. Which city do you belong to? Which are, one are you going to belong to? You can be a part of the heavenly Jerusalem in the midst of Babylon the Great, by the way. That's the problem. They're not actual geographical cities anymore. But I like an usurped town. What's a usurped town? Well, it's a town that's been taken over by an illegitimate ruler. A usurper has crept in. He rules the city. I like an usurped town to another do labor to admit you, but oh, to no end. Reason your viceroy me, me should defend, but is captive and proves weak or untrue. In other words, I cannot think myself out of this problem because my thoughts are corrupted. I should be able to think clearly. I can't think clearly. Smart people always think they can think, of themse think themselves out of every problem. The solution to human sin is the one that the child can embrace. You don't have to be smart to be a Christian, which is proved by the fact that most Christians aren't very smart. But uh, that's actually not funny, but it is, uh, for me it is sort of funny because I don't know how many smart people I know who are infuriated by the fact and mocking the fact that people are Christians and live happy lives and they don't for all of their intelligence. They're very miserable, very smart and very, and very miserable. And they are very smart, by the way. But reason your vice, it should defend me, but it's captive as well. And it proves weak or untrue. Okay, so if that's the case, I can't solve my own problem. Well, he said that already in the first, and now he's applied it more broadly, a different metaphor. And yet, for all of the fact that just as in Romans 7, the Apostle Paul says the, the evil that I don't want to do, I do, and the good that I do want to do, I don't do. So that contradiction within him, he really wants to be this way. But even there, yet dearly I love you and would be loved fain. This word fain means dearly again, I'm saying it twice, would be loved dearly. But now here's the real problem. But am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me. God hates divorce, not this divorce. This divorce he sanctions, divorce from the devil and from the world and from sin. Break that knot. Divorce me, untie or break that knot again. No, he's calling to God to do all this. He doesn't think that he can initiate this. He, God, he needs divine help. Break that knot. Take me to you, imprison me, for I accept you, enthrall me, make me your slave. Never shall be free. The freedom of the Christian is slavery to Christ. That's how Paul puts it again in Romans 7. He says, either I'm going to be a slave to sin or I'm going to be a slave to Christ, but I'm going to be a slave one way or the other. I have a master. Which one will I serve? But I will not be my own. I'm not in charge of my own life. I'm going to give over the control to somebody else. If I think it, I'm in charge of myself, that's my sin, thinking that I have autonomy from God and from the devil. I don't have any such autonomy. That's one of the devil's great ruses. I am, in, I am a slave of someone. But in, so except you enthrall me, never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. Now chastity is purity, and he will get this purity by God forcing himself upon him or her. Ravish is a violent sexual encounter. As I say, this is a violent poem. But again, the idea of the beloved and that there, it, he's desperate. I don't want you to take it too literally. And as I say, a trigger alert, it is sort of a triggering actually in this sense. But it, it's, a, it's a desperation he's expressing and the contrast between slavery and freedom. 
and chastity and being ravished. Look at how C.S. Lewis presents it in, if you, have you read um, Till We Have Faces? Read that wonderful book. The God, the lover of our souls, pursuing us. From the outside, God looks like a brute. From the inside, the person concerned is so delighted. That, anyway, that's the, what Don's expressing. Now, it, can, it concludes, as I say, with you, you. So it's not resolved. He just realizes this is how desperate the case is. He's moved on to Sonnet 14. How radical is the solution? That's how radical. I'll leave it off with that because I've overshot my time. <laughs>